All right. Well, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Ashley Piedmont, and uh, I am the Master Gardener Coordinator for Cornell Property Extension Master Gardener Program. So I am generally not the one that's able to come out and be in front of everybody. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, this has been a presentation that's been put on by our volunteers. Um, and so Yuri Kushner, who is kind of our vegetable guru, uh, usually does this presentation and he couldn't be here today. So he asked me if I could step in and I'm like, of course, this is wonderful. Um, so does anybody have any experience with Cornell Cooperative Extension? Are you guys familiar with our Master Gardener program at all? You've used the services before or you've attended programming? Oh, no, okay. In Monroe County? Uh -huh. Oh, wonderful. Are you willing to share? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Awesome. So, you, so you're very familiar with programming. Anything else familiar with Master Gardener? Who they are, what they do, why they're in the community? Um, or how about extension services? Are you familiar with what extension services are um, within the community? No, nope. at all. Um, so do you mind if I diverge a little bit and just kind of fill you in a little bit about the background of Cornell Cooperative Extension? So we are um, part of the Land Grant University, which is our Cornell University in, in New York. And so what I talk about in New York is completely separate than what happens in every other state. So if you've ever been researching and you see Pennsylvania State or, you know, PSU University, um, Michigan, um, every other county or every other state works completely different than New York is. Um, and so every single uh, county within New York State has their own extension office. Um, and it just depends on what services they provide. But here in Monroe County, we have a 4-H program that's really, really popular. We have an agriculture educator. We have natural resources, commercial and residential horticulture. Um, we have a lab that does a lot of like soil testing, insect identification, disease identification. Um, in nutrition program, which is um, we have a county nutrition educator and then SNAP. Um, so we are a very large program. We're all educators. We're all out in the community educating in our kind of our own little realm. Um, so I think there's about 18 staff, um, but our master gardener program is the largest program within extension services. I just graduated last Saturday, a whole new round of volunteers. So our volunteer pool is up to 128 active master gardeners throughout the county. Um, so we provide services that are um, only for residential gardens. So we don't touch farmers, we don't touch commercial properties. Um, we are really only for the residents of the country. And that is all of them. So from border to border, you know, all the way around. Um, so some of the services we provide, this is part of our speaker bureau presentation. Um, it's always run by volunteers. I'm the only staff member in the program. Um, so everything is volunteer led. Um, and volunteer based, um, which makes them absolutely beautiful because this is all of their time, their hard work, and energy that they put into the program. Speakers Bureau provides 45 minute presentations, usually with a 15 minute question and answer period. Um, so that's where we do a lot with garden clubs, we do a lot with um, community organizations such as Country Map, we do a lot with um, libraries. We see us a lot at libraries and stuff like that. So this would be our speakers bureau. We do home site assessments, which is if you bought a new house, um, you have gardens that you're unfamiliar with, um, we send master gardeners out to kind of help problem solve uh, issues that you might be having in your home. Um, you're not sure how to maybe bring back part of your yard that's through wild, or you really need some assistance on how um, to incorporate pollinators in your garden, any, anything like that. Uh, any questions that you might have, and you get to that volunteer to come for an hour to your home. It is a paid service. It's a seventy-five dollar fee. They give you a really big write-up at the end, so and, and they give you a ton of resources. So it just depends on what your questions are. Is what they'll be mm -hmm. um, Lots of other programs. I won't go into all of them. Uh, we have a garden helpline. I think that's really really important for you all to know. It's a free service. You can call, and a volunteer will call you back. So you could say, oh my gosh, I'm growing these beautiful tomatoes and my leaves are all yellowing. What is wrong? And they will um, provide you with research-based, factual-based information um, that comes right from Cornell University. Um, so it is a wonderful service. You can call them, you can email them, um, and that somebody, one of the volunteers will return your, your call and information. Um, 
If anybody follows the Seneca Zoo, we just won on Wednesday the Innovative Award for a Black and Blue program that we run, which is all about building communities for current activities. Um, so we work a lot in um, urban, lower resource neighborhoods in the city of Rochester, and we teach uh, gardening skills. Um, and with that gardening skills is how we build their community up. Um, and so that's a really great program that is getting, uh, we just, we're in June, we'll be heading to Kansas. We just won an award through the International Texas Garden for an innovative program that was born and bred by the field. So we are so, so proud of this program. So yeah, we are everywhere. Um, we are a really great team. We are be at family events, so please stop by and ask any kind of gardening related questions. So I started in April of 2021. Uh, I have a background in horticulture. I graduated from Finger Lakes Community College. Um, I've always loved to garden. Well, I shouldn't say I've always loved gardening. I did not like gardening when I was younger because my mom used to use it as like a go out and leave the garden as a chore, right? <laughs> but it's surprisingly how much that has stuck with me and like growing up into my adulthood. So after college, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I love people, right? I love socializing and I love gardening and growing and being able to be sustainable for myself and my family. And so I'm actually a horticultural therapist by trade. Um, so it's not usually about the end product, but it's about using horticulture as a modality, right, to heal um, body, body, mind, and soul. So um, that's where my background is. I worked with people with disabilities for 10 years prior to becoming um, the uh, Master Gardening Coordinator here at the Convention. So I started in 2021, April of 2021. So we're going into my third season. Um, and I am amazed every day of the work that we do right here in the county. So. <laughs> Today we're here to talk about gardeners' favorite vegetable. Um, this is, like I said, a program that is usually done by Yuri, and he asked me to step in for him today. So I read through the PowerPoint. It's a wonderful PowerPoint. I'm happy to share it with you today, but I'm going to throw it. I'm going to probably go off script a little bit and talk about other things as we go. So uh, anybody new to vegetable gardening? Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Okay. <laughs> So something that you would like to do as a hobby. I'm just trying to get a feel for like what direction I should go in with some of my uh, offshoots here. So hobby, you're interested in being sustainable and growing food for your family. Are you growing for a community plot? Um, so you're growing for food banks or food pantries to give away. Okay, so mostly for yourselves and your family. Okay, great, awesome. Um, right. So one part of gardening that everybody always misses out on is the stop, think, and plan part. Um, planning is so, so, so important. And there's so many things that go into planning. And you can find some really great charts online and stuff where it gives you kind of like um, what seed type you're going to use. Are you going to put seed? Are you going to do it by transplant? And so that really helps you kind of figure out what you want to do. And then grass paper is really important. Um, you should really draw out your space because you got to think of your garden, not just you're going to plant the summer garden, but you're going to plant a spring garden, you're going to plant a summer garden, you're going to plant a fall garden, okay? So your garden isn't just, I'm planting tomatoes, it's a one-time thing where one is done, or I'm going to put cucumbers here and then when they die, oh well, um, that's just, you can use that space over and over and over again. Um, and so you really should plan out what you want to grow and when you want to reap those things, okay? So gardening, there is not just from just not warm weather, right? You can garden in the winter, you can garden in early spring, you can garden in late fall. And that's kind of where some of my fans themselves go off script a little bit when I talk about those kinds of things. Um, so it says, think big, start small, and be practical. Really understand why you want to grow what you want to grow. Um, and you really need to have a little bit of um, So, um, anybody ever overplant tomatoes or overplant zucchini and you have a, like, a huge abundance or then you buy them in six packs in the store and you're like, oh my gosh, I got to plant them, right? I bought six of them. I have to plant them. And then you're like, oh, <laughs> mature tomatoes take 36 by 36 inches of your garden for plant. So planning that planning stage is very, very, very important. Um, Planning to read the back of your seed packet is so important to figure out, um, you know, how much space you're going to need to plant that garden. So lots of things go into the planning part. So I always say, go small and do it really, really well, and then add up. 
um, because it's really hard when you get a seed packet to pick a thousand seeds not to plant them all, right? That's so difficult not to do, or to succession plant them, uh, stuff like that. So I and a lot of the very experienced gardeners miss this planning stage, which is really, really important, especially when we get a really nice day and you're like, oh, I'm going to go out there and we need to plant really quick. Um, so general growing requirements, your spot is the most important thing that you can come up with, right? Um, if you're planning a new garden, monitor that sunlight in your garden, because that's going to be the most important. If you don't have enough sun, you're going to have a very unsuccessful garden. So I'm looking at a place on my property right now. I literally go out at you know, 11 o'clock and see where the sun is. Then I go back out a couple hours later and see where the sun is. Really, really important that you have enough sun to actually grow a healthy vegetable garden. Um, some do grow in shade, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So six to eight hours is considered full time. We pass on a perennial or a, uh, an annual uh, vegetable plant. Uh, six to eight hours is full time. Okay, so protection from the wind, close to the kitchen. I, I think he really means like you need to be in your garden every day. If you're not in your garden every day, you're going to miss something. You're going to miss that ripening vegetable. You're going to miss the cracks in your tomatoes. You're going to miss maybe a pest or disease that just happened to happen overnight. Okay. So you, you need to have your garden in a location that's really convenient for you. And not just your garden, but your compost pile. It's really important to also have kind of near your... Did you have a question? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. please stop anytime, anytime. Uh, it does, Sorry. Uh, afternoon sun is better because it's warmer. Your afternoon sun is definitely warmer. A, a really prolific vegetable garden would, would be really well for 10 to 14 months. So six to eight is the very low end of your full sun. And if it is, it would be after the sun. So that's when it's better. Yeah, so thank you for that. That's really great. Um, know your soil, right? I mean, I know that it's really easy to say, oh my gosh, I'm digging and it's like really clay or it's really full of rock. Um, but really get to know your soil. There's a lot of really great resources on learning your soil texture through a soil silk test, which is just making, just rubbing it between your fingers and making what they call ribbons, right? Um, you can test your soil with the jar method. If you can see how much sand, soap, and clay is in there, just by using a mason jar or a recyclable jar uh, at home, like a hot sauce jar, some glass that you can put soil in, shake it with water, and watch how it settles out. Um, is a really great way to do it. So any kind of way to really learn what kind of soil you have, and then what kind of amendments. Um, so know your soil type. Nutrients and organic matter content, it's really important to know, is there vitamins in that soil? Um, do, hmm? So, can you recommend the particular soil testers that, that are out there? <laughs> I, I've never tested my soil. Yeah. I mean, I live in Orleans County, we're uh, not too far from St. Ontario. Oh. It's okay. really dark, really black. I mean, we grow things really well, but I noticed the farmers around sped out an awful lot of line. Um, mm. Now I know they're just field corn. They're not plants made of the way we are, but um, <clears throat> you suggest any good soil testers or out there? Yeah, so I always highly recommend a soil sample. Um, for a new garden space, um, I would go right through your extension service. We have a lab here in Monroe County. Um, she can give you the pH texture or the pH levels of your soil and the soil texture. Um, I'm not 100% sure the like what Orleans County actually has available to them. I'm not sure about their services through their extension office. What about stuff that you can do yourself? Yeah. Um, I don't know what's on the market, and in this kind of field, I try not to make recommendations. Um, for soil pH testing, though, you can definitely get set right on the page. Yep, I know that you're not even right on. Yeah, yeah, it's really important. Did you have a question? Yeah. That's right here. I know and I gather all these leaves from my kids' house and whatever. Oh, good. And I put them in my garden. You know, before you went up there. Uh -huh. Am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing? No, that's really great. And mm -hmm. that soil for example, is it good for your garden? Uh, no, it's not to break them down, but if you wanted to help them break down faster, especially like oh, can you take a really long time to break down? Just set them on your driveway or somewhere and just roll over them with your lawnmower a few times. I can just roll chop them up. Yeah. And then let the snow and everything and yeah. then them all over. Yeah, and, and are they disintegrated usually by the end of the day? Yeah, no, that's a 
that's perfect. Yeah, as long as you're just turning them in, that's great. Yeah. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so um, knowing your soil type and knowing your pH levels is what's really going to start kind of you off on the right track. So if you're trying to grow blueberries and your pH is totally wrong, you're not going to get a very good track. Um, same thing with vegetables. So vegetables like between a 6 and a 7.5 uh, pH, and we are usually around there naturally in the county, but it's really great to just kind of have your um, pH checked if you don't. Um, and then wherever your garden is, you want to avoid any kind of standing water, cooling water. Um, so your location is really, really important for your garden. And that's going to be different for everybody, right? That's going to be different for my house versus your house as due to your population. So my garden has like, it's going to need like four knots built around it just to actually keep anything because I have groundhogs under my shed and deer that graze everything that are eating deer. So um, it's going to be different for everybody. Do you have a question? The same issue. Yeah, we're trying to have some very high ones. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, that would work fine. Um, I mean, no offense, you can cut and then you can add a second layer on the top if you want. Yeah. So we have something called the cell phone project at our office right now. We installed it last year. Um, and it's a really big farm where we teach um, youth um, workforce development skills. Um, so we put up plastic fencing all the way around. I mean, the rendezvous is heavy and dear. And so it's plastic and glass. And like we literally, two staff pulled it and another staff went through and like just stapled it on. So a snow fence would work fine. Um, it's just the height that's really important. Um, the other thing is, like, deer need to know where they're going to land. So if you can like, make it so it's hard for them to see where they're jumping into. Um, I've also heard that putting your fence is vertical um, is a really good deterrent because it's a really tall one. So I guess that is something you might want to trial. Um, because if they're jumping, they can't see where they're landing, then they won't get it. So a lot of orchards would do that instead of going really tall, they kind of go vertical. Um, at least that's what I've been seeing. So. Yeah. What about plants that were here that you don't like? Do that, do that, does that work? Or? Really, you've got to change your technique as often as possible. Uh, deer are very smart. <laughs> uh, really aromatic smelling plants for deer care, not just deer, but most you know, animals away. So if you can like provide like an herb garden that's really, you know, Smelly on the outside, that would work really well. Allium flowers would work really, really well. Plant your garlic on the outside of your garden. Anything that they taste and it's flavorful, they want. So, but then again, I have deer resistant plants and if they're hungry enough, they'll eat it. So, um, but yeah, you can put some plants. Yep. So, Know your crop family. This is kind of important as well because when you talk about plants, you talk about the soil, which is one of the most important things, right? Your soil, your sun, and your water. Those are your three main staples for any garden, especially a vegetable garden. Um, so knowing your family type is important because then you know what nutrients that they can get for you. So your soil really is your nutrient, right? And your water source. And so knowing which family is when you're going to do your crop. So when you do crop rotation, you're going to rotate by family, okay? So you're not going to put uh, squash in a bed one year, and then the next year you're going to plant zucchini. Same family. You want to rotate your crops with different uh, vegetable families, which are all kind of just good here. Oh, yes. Um, so those are your main families where most of our uh, herbs and vegetables kind of live. But knowing your your families is going to be most important. So when you are doing your planning and your planning rotation, this is some of the information that you're going to want to make sure that you need, right? And why is that important? You need to crop rotate. You can't plant the same crop in the same plot every single year, year after year after year. Um, every plant, just like us, every every one of us, we require different vitamins, right, to keep us healthy. And so. Plants will take the nutrients out of that soil uh, that they need to provide a healthy yield and a big strong plant. Um, but other plants use different nutrients. And so if you're only depleting that one nutrient out of that soil over and over and over again, uh, that plant is not going to be happy and healthy in the same way. Is that the same for a Yeah. 
that is any bed, raised bed, in-ground bed, container. Yep. So any kind of add like new soil every year. You can, but the other reason why you crop rotate is because um, a lot of diseases are sold soil borne, mm -hmm. and they're also specific to certain plants. And so, if you have a soil borne pathogen that loves tomatoes, uh, that can overwinter in your soil. But if you plant squash there, it might not have the same, it might not attack the same host. So, the reason why you crop rotate is not only for nutrient depletion, um, but also for soil borne pathogens. And insects that might be overwintering. They all have specific host points. So. so, how much to water and when you water? Uh, like I said, watering is one of the other big main staples in gardening. So, your garden, vegetable or not, or ornamental gardens, they need an inch of water. Um, and so, the best thing you can do during your planting phases is put in a, um, a water gauge. I'm sure they sell them right here. I'm, I'm assuming they sell them right here, but you can do as simple as like a recyclable um, pudding container or yogurt container and measure up an inch and you know secure it into your garden so it doesn't trip over. But you need to know how much water you're actually getting in your garden um, because you can overwater your garden and lose plants. You can underwater and you can ruin your fruit on your, your your plants as well. So knowing how much water you actually need to go out there and do. Right, not like you need to water every day because you might not need to, depending on how much water you got there. Okay, can I do a question? Yeah, uh, I've been told, and I've, I've been trying to do this, that you are not allowed to water tomatoes because the leaves will get a fungus or whatever it is. So, you always water, you try to water everything at the ground level. Yeah, yeah, and that's a great, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Just think of it as like <clears throat> when you're really thirsty, you just don't pour water all over your head and like it doesn't absorb through our skin and our hair and our nails, right? Uh, we actually have to ingest it. And so the plants are not ingesting water through their leaves, their stems, their fruit. They're only using it through their roots, right? The roots of their straw. Um, so the best thing to do is only water it from, which is right? Especially if you're doing it for a therapeutic or a social benefit, right? Like one of my favorite things to do is stand outside after a long day and water my garden with my cup of coffee and just listen to the birds and feel the wind. And so sometimes you do it, you know, for yourself. You're not doing it just for the garden itself. But um, yeah, so you need to water uh, generously. Ways to be sustainable in your garden. Uh, one is not to open up. Um, because you're losing most of that water through um, evaporation, um, and it's really bad for your plants. If you water really early in the morning with a sprinkler that might go like this, and that water is sitting on the leaves when it comes to noontime, that sun is going to keep that water and burn through your leaves. So you do not want to do that. Um, best thing you can do is um, water at ground surface, and you want to water in the morning because you want your soil to dry out. That day. People always ask, well, can I do it later in the day? I don't have time to do it in the morning. And there's ways that you can do automatic water, right? If you have a drip hose system, you can put a timer. Um, these are ways that you don't actually have to go out and do anything, right? It just automatically will water for you. Um, sometimes people are uh, lucky to have those pocket sprinklers in their, in their lawns. Um, so um, if you water later in the evening, you are in your plants of wet feet when they go to bed at night, they're going to have more opportunity for bacteria and fungus to grow. Um, a lot of powdery mildew, so especially like any of your squash family plants, um, that's when all of those bad diseases start, right? You're cold, wet, and dark. Okay, the sun will dry it out just enough to where you'll be good. So if you can water, I would say before four o'clock, but you want to avoid that hot when the heat is the sun is hot. Okay. So here's some examples of like a drip irrigation system. Um, this is really great, especially if you want to save time. Maybe you're starting a new garden, um, or you don't want to have to be out there trying to water all the time, or you don't want to drag these hoses out all the time. Um, I know I'm I'm really bad at that, and my husband always comes behind me and holds the hose up because I just leave it. I'm like, I got I need it smart, so it's gonna be across the grass. But um, so drip irrigation works really well. Soaker hoses work really well. What I have learned is that those soaker hoses and those those hoses, they need to be right at the root of the plant, okay? 
So they don't, they will soak a large area if you leave them on for a really, really long time. But the point is to get it directly into the root. So if you can like wrap it around the plant and then go to another section and wrap around, or even use like those short six foot um, plane hoses in between your soaker hoses if you have a long area to go where you don't actually need to be watered. Um, just be careful when you are going in because sometimes they bury mine. And then I then I forget they're there and then I plant something that I had to have and so just be conscious of where your your lines are going. So this is a little bit more complex to start, but it, in the long run, it will save you skin Um, so raised beds are becoming really, really popular. I would consider any raised bed does not need to have this fancy wood boundary, right? You don't actually need anything raised on the side of it to be considered a raised garden. So if you're starting a new garden in a new location and you want it off the ground, I would start by lasagna. Um, has anybody heard of the lasagna garden method? Um, so basically what it is, is it's a really healthy compost pile in the bed shape. And so if you're starting a new garden, you don't need to dig out all of that sod. You don't need to remove all of the grass. You just need to put a hefty layer of cardboard in that area, measure it out, make it nice, however you'd like, and then cardboard and then wet it and then make sure that it overlaps significantly so that no sun gets in. So it'll smother the grass. Uh, and then some really thin chopped up sticks and then some leaves and then some food scraps or grass clippings and then all over again. And you keep doing it. And it'll get to be quite high. You can cover it with hay and it will take a while. It'll take time, but it's way easier to have a beautiful compost pile than it is to dig out and then to bask it. How much soil are you talking to? If you did it now, you could probably plant in the fall. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So it definitely takes some planning, but it's less expensive and it's sustainable because you can use things that you can find right on your own property. Okay, food scraps right out of your kitchen, leaves right from your property, um, sticks right from your property or your neighbor's property or somebody that you know. So yeah, it's a really great way to kind of start off. Can you do that and then put um Soil on top of the top layer to leave the plant. You could, um, but the nutrients that are breaking that compost down would be healthier and you would have to buy it. Uh, depending on what you're planting, because tomatoes need at least a minimum of 12 inches. So, depending on how much topsoil you're actually interested in putting in. Yeah, definitely can do that. Now, I know that the Greece. Mm -hmm. The municipality? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They over here, they had a huge, this is what I remember, had a huge uh, post pile that anybody can go and get. Yeah. Most municipalities do. Yeah. They also mentioned that they are not good for reception. Yeah, there's all sorts of plastic and stuff in there when you go in. Yeah. But it's good for you. It is great for your flower beds. You do, yeah. If you have a covered area, you just go get some of that stuff and mix it in. And wham. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Compost is one of your best yeah. oil amendments. So yeah. If you're going to go out, I just don't like it. I just like it. It's great. You need out the plastic. Yeah. And, and put it everywhere. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So most municipalities do give out free compost. They just, I wouldn't use it in your vegetables. But yeah. Your lawn is great, your ornamental gardens are great. Yeah, your flower gardens, yep, all of that. Just not your vegetable garden. Yeah. Still but <laughs> don't put plastic or weeds. Exactly. Um, and that kind of brings me into like if you're trying to be sustainable and in your own, you should really have a compost bin. It does not have to be a fancy pallet wood, it doesn't have to be something built. I literally took some logs, I made three sides on it, and I just have a pile. And I'll tell you, my daughter loves to bury food scraps in our yard every year or every week. So um, so raised beds are really great. Um, I have a raised bed and mine's made out of rocks. Um, so I actually don't have anything fancy or neat like these beautiful beds out here are, but um, better drainage. Um, you can go organic if you do a raised bed. Uh, you can't really say that you're truly organic if you're growing directly in the ground, even if you are using organic practices, right? And so if you want to grow truly organic, we can do that in a raised bed. Um, your soil warms up quickly because it's above the ground. 
um, and you don't have any soil compaction, that depends on what you put in it, right? That's really important. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to work with, especially if you have any kind of a physical um, ailment. Um, if your back hurts, your knees hurt really bad. Um, I love race beds, and I prefer them over uh, in your own garden. Um, they're visually appealing and organized as long as you make them visually appealing, right? And organized. Um, I've definitely seen some that have seen better days that could, could use some replacement. So it just depends on how often you're maintaining your, your garden bed and the wood or the material that you use for it. Um, keeps your pathways clear from weeding. You get a lot less weeds in a raised bed depending on how much you're maintaining your, your soil. Um, it's definitely a barrier for pests, some pests. Um, not obviously not the flying pests. Um, it allows for hoops and trellises, so the same garden. So it just depends on what your specific needs are and how much space you really want because getting started in race that dirty is going to be expensive, Okay. So we have um, on our website, we have lots of like resources on like how to build a race bed and what wood to use for a race bed. And with lumber prices right now, it's really expensive. Um, however, a few years ago, you know, lumber wasn't as so, um, just depends on what you build. Um, and if you're using concrete, just make sure you're assessing your soil for Okay. Um, so, there are tubes for extension of seasons, pest protection, and climbing supports. So many vegetables would benefit from trellising or vertical gardening. So many <coughs> vegetables. And what's really great about it is during the planting stage, there's so much extra space that you can right? So instead of your cucumbers sprawling throughout your entire garden, if you grow them up, you have a space all along both sides of them that you can grow, right? And so you can use recyclable material. These are absolutely gorgeous, having the, the one in the back. Gosh, beautiful. Um, but you could use like the bottom of a crib, right? The spring in the bottom of a crib or recycled the tire rims I've seen. Um, so you can be really creative and really sustainable in your own home by using things that you already have. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, it can just be creative, right? And that's what a lot of our mean is the creative art form, right? Um, so these guys are just using some plastic fencing to grow. Um, and this is a really great feature. It's just really thin PVC piping. It's um, uh, flexible when it's that thin. It's really, really flexible. Um, and so if you could just use, I think these are like little pipe fitters, these little galvanized things on the outside. And you just get a fatter piece of PVC to put on, to put the hoops in. Um, and if you can start during your planning phase, putting something like that in, it's really great because not only can you put over a row cover, which is like that white fabric that people use, it still lets the light in, it still lets the water in, but it doesn't let the pop stick to your plants, okay? So if you're having like an infestation of like light fires or something, you can put this row cover over it. Um, and the other really great thing to planning is we, you could already be growing your spinach. You could be growing lettuce. You could be growing carrots now. You could have grown them a month ago if you had a row cover. So it's really great with plastic. Not that what you need. With plastic. Um, and you, you you could have already been harvesting your fresh vegetables. And, it's almost and like a little green. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, how do you I'm sorry. If, if your vegetables are covered. Yeah. Oh, you just remove it. So it's just you use clips. You could just use like little like clips, almost like binder clips, right? And you just clip the plastic on, and then when you need access, you just unclip them, you roll it back, or you pull it up on the side. If you go on like Pinterest or any of those, they have all different kinds of like DIY projects that you can do with like sides that are wooden that you can pull up and stuff. But just for a very simple like row cover to do an early extension. Uh, it's in plastic, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so, and it's a big cost a lot to do, but were you talking about like cost mm -hmm. roll cover? Yeah, row cover is so essentially uh, having these, and then you just simply line it with either a white fabric or um, clear plastic, depending okay. on the mm -hmm. nope. no. No. no, right. So a lot of black plastics used in vegetable gardens on the soil surface because that will absorb the heat from the sun and warm your soil faster. Uh -huh. But it, like an opaque, kind of like a clear or an opaque um, would be better because then the sun will be so close to the surface. Yeah. 
So um, that is kind of like row covers in the beginning. So now we're going to get into like, I guess, the 10 top vegetables that people like to grow. Um, the legume family is really, really great because they have these nodules on their roots, right? These are the only plants that actually have nitrogen fixing bacteria on their roots. And so what they do is they get in there and then they help fix nitrogen that other plants can't take off, okay? So they take unusable nitrogen, make it usable for other plants. And in return, they eat the carbohydrates and the sugars that provide the dirty stuff, okay? And so um, after your legumes are in your bed and that legume family, then you're gonna want something that's heavy, uh, heavy nitrogen to eat. Okay? So just make sure when you're thinking about your crop rotation, you're thinking about who's following who and when, okay? Because that's really, really important. Um, so that is kind of your legume family, beans, soybeans, peas, lentils, um, and even think about your winter garden, right? You don't have a garden just for one time of year. You have a spring, summer, fall, and winter garden. And that late fall, winter is going to be your cover crops, okay? Unless you're doing row covers and you're growing fall party vegetables. Um, so growing peas, um, you know, it's great. We all get spring fever, right? We want to get out there right away, right away. We want to put stuff in the ground. The problem is, is that you're wasting your time and your money and your resources, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's too cold for plant, for those seeds to germinate, they're going to be stunted. And so it's almost like you're already kind of putting stress on that plant or that seed to germinate before it's even ready. Um, so you've got to make sure they do sell soil temperature checkers if you're really interested to know what soil temperature you have. Um, but just know that you, your soil temperatures need to be a little bit warmer, okay? And you can pre-warm them with um, to just kind of help, especially in a smaller area, but just depends on how big your garden is. Um, so just know that sometimes patience is really, really important. Um, so growing your peas, um, they say to pre-soak them because they're really dehydrated, they're really dry. Um, and that will just help kind of crack that outer shell to be able to start that kind of growing stuff. Um, and then you can sow, I would sow like every couple weeks, right? So that you just have a continuous harvest, okay? Um, so, so if you see, you can plant them directly one to four inches apart, um, just depends on how much you would like to harvest. And it also depends on how you're going to use your vegetables. If you think, if you grew up with a really big canning family and you're interested in canning and preserving, or, uh, you know, there's seven different ways to preserve your vegetables. So it just depends on how much you're trying to get in that book. And then what are you going to do with your apples? Okay. So staking peas, again, all different kinds of ways to trellis. Um, just depends on, you know, your garden space. What does your garden space look like? A lot of people are using arbors now from one to the next bed. Um, so you gotta keep them standing up. So beans, same thing, uh, depending on what kind of beans, which is really, really important during the planting stage to know what variety you're gonna be growing. You're growing bush beans, whole beans. Um, bush beans are, you can grow them in containers. They're really great for containers. Um, whole beans obviously will need kind of that support. Um, <clears throat> So they want you to avoid overhead um, watering, and that's because they don't want that water sitting on your roots. That is a factor for causing diseases. Um, most of the information for planting seeds and stuff are all in your seed packet. Um, and there's three different ways to plant. Um, you plant in a row, you can band plant, which is what kind of spreading seeds, um, kind of like spreading them out in just a rectangular square shape. Um, and then you can go back in and deep thin your process instead of uh, planting them, you know, every so often. So bush beans, um, one one seed per hole, an inch deep, four inches apart. Um, and this one is my favorite. Um, down here in the corner, you can actually plant them all like around the teepee, and then in the peak of season, they'll be completely covered, and it provides a really great shade space for you to sit and enjoy your garden, right? Gardening doesn't always have to be about the work, but it can be about the fastest pleasures as well, right? When you sit and you watch that hummingbird and you sit and watch that bumblebee come to your vegetable plants, um, those are like the really the joys that you get out of it. Not only <laughs> is it good, you know, to harvest and to grab fresh fruit, but there's a lot more to gardening. It, it, at least uh, if you enjoy it as a hobby, there's a lot more that comes out of it than the fruit. So um, I just see like my kids like using that space as like a little hideout. Like, so or or for yourself, you put a beautiful chair in there and really enjoy that space. Um, 
Um, so all different kinds of methods. Yes. Um, and by all the cities. Yeah, it's the beginning of the year, and I may need maybe well a half a cup. Yes. What can they do to preserve those seeds from next year? Yeah, so most seeds um can stay good for a really long time. Um some seeds not so good, but some seeds stay good for a really long time. Cool, dark place, they say like uh fridge. I've heard fridge. I haven't heard freezer. Huh, I haven't heard freezer. I've definitely heard fridge. Um yeah, you can. Yep. Or you can donate them to a local seed library. Um, you can go to seed swapping events. There was one last night in the city of Rochester that was a really big success. Um, and to be sustainable, save your seeds for your garden. You don't have to buy them again. Yeah. So you can let your seeds, your vegetables go to seed and harvest and dry your own seeds, um, especially with beans and peas. Leave them on the vine until they're dry. A nice, dry, sunny day, a wet, yucky day. Uh, just bring them in and once they're dry, shell them. Yeah. And then you'll have seeds for next year. So really being sustainable in your building is, you know, utilizing what you have. And then it becomes cheaper too, right? And you spend money in other spots. Yeah, I did, I did that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So really, you can see if they have anything in your garden if you really like that. So just some different options. Tomatoes. Everybody loves tomatoes. Um, tomatoes can be tough or they can be really great depending on the variety you have um, and uh, you know kind of what you're looking at. Um, tomatoes are what we consider tropical plants. They like hot feet. If you put them in too soon, they're not going to do well for you. They're going to be stunted. They can you know they will not produce a high yield if you put them in too soon. So if you plant most of your garden, you're going to wait for your tropicals, your tomatoes, your eggplants, your peppers, or tropical plants that they get hot. They want their feet warm. So if you put them in too soon, it's like going outside, you know, on that really warm day, it's still in the middle of winter in shorts, you know, it's just, it's not ready. You're not ready yet to come for that. So just know that tomatoes can be very particular, especially with our weather changing so frequently. They like consistent water. Um, if we get a dry period and then a lot of rain, that's going to cause a lot of cracking or casing in your tomatoes. So your fruit will tell you what's going on in your garden. The tomatoes are a big one. They get black spot. They get a lot of fungus and disease. So when you're planting your tomatoes, know how much you actually need to yield. Are you canning your tomatoes and making sauce? Do you really need that many tomatoes? And then any garden, you plant from the sure size. Tomatoes need a lot of space. And it's not just space for growing, but they need space for air to move through them. That's what's going to reduce your, your pest and disease factors, right? So you need to make sure that there's space that air can move through your through your tomatoes. And then they take a lot of attention. They need pruning, they need shaking, they need trellising. Um, they break easy, their fruit is heavy. So they do need a lot more support than um, I've ever, ever provided, right? You just put that orange Medicaid mm -hmm. on and we'll think you're doing it great, but. So, no, so actually, that's a great any. question. So you got to know, are you going to have a determinate or an indeterminate variety, right? And so there's two different kinds of tomato. One is really, really great for containers. Okay, you're determinate, which means they already know genetically in their plant bodies how big they're going to get, how much they're going to produce, okay? And so determinate's really great because they're short, bushy, they produce one time, and then that's it, okay? So determinant are your ones that grow really, really, really tall um, and that you have to continuously stake. Um, okay, so there's two different kinds. So depending on the seeds that you're growing um, or the plants that you're purchasing in the store. So that it just all depends. Um, so determinant tomatoes are really great, especially if you're gardening with limited space because you could move them in a container and put it on your side porch. Um, determinant ones over here. Um, so you can tell in the picture here that the indeterminate are trellising. So really you want to keep one main terminal bud. You want that one top bud. 
And then if you see the plant starting to make offshoots for like a second plant, that's when you cut that off right into stem. But don't throw it away because tomatoes grow roots out of their stems. So you can just put it in some soil or put it in some water, let it grow roots. So it's like a freebie. Um, but you do want to cut it off because you want that plant's energy to grow tall and produce fruit versus trying to produce tons and tons and tons of offshoots and then you get no fruit by the end of the year, right? So you've got to be able to know your variety. For mm -hmm. mm -hmm. tomato, yeah. like a 30 to 40 gallon or a quart, so like an eight gallon pot would probably be good. Five gallons if it's like a small, you know, your root space is determinant on how big the plant is going to be. So if you put a tomato in a really small pot, you're not going to have it grow to its mature size. So the more root space that you can give that plant, the better. Um, and that's why they grow gardens are so hard. So those plants just continuously grow their roots as long as ever they can. So always searching for food and always searching for water. But in a pot or in a large raised bed, you're limiting that space and you're limiting the natural nutrients in the soil. So although container gardens and pots are really great, you have to be more cognizant on nutrient depletion and water. Okay. So that is yeah, so of course I don't have boxes I bring fed growing tomatoes. No. Like at all. Wow. And they just they don't produce fruit. They well, just it's that and I don't know if I overwater underwater is just the leaves turn yellow and die, or sort of. Okay. Um, so, do they grow really tall and green and just not produce fruit? Yes. So, you probably like, during fruit, plants really need a high nitrogen concentration because phosphorus is really great because that can cause a really great strong root system. But as they're starting to bloom, you need to put them with some nitrogen, whether it's synthetic or natural organic fertilizer. Um, do you? Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I, I know, yeah, I, I've never used, I personally have no experience. Um, I use a lot of organic material in my gardens, and so usually that kind of helps, but yeah, you got to hit it with that high nitrogen, basically with this foot to set off. Yeah, I would definitely try that. And then also, and especially in a raised bed, you're responsible for all of the nutrient content in that soil. In the ground, Mother Nature does most of that. So if you're raised, if you're gardening in a raised bed, I would highly suggest a pH test that was for you. Mm -hmm. Any questions about indeterminate versus determinate tomatoes? Um, if you're buying tomatoes in the store, they say buy them when they're already to eight weeks tall. Um, you know, always make sure that you're loosening that root growth because they're growing in the pot, which means the roots are going to grow in a circle. You really want them to grow out once they get into your spot. So always loosen up that. That you follow as much as possible. Um, and in labeling, do you buy them like the two things? You got to look up the variety name that you're buying. So if you can Google like Big Boy Tomato, you'll find out all their explicit accounting or something different. Usually your porch patio ones are like the big fat tomatoes and the determinants are like great and low ones and, and stuff like that. So, yep. Uh, so just a recap on tomatoes, um, indoor seeding, they need 14 to 16 hours if you're growing them, um, transplant early, um, they want, they say to choose all different varieties, right, so that you're getting the tomatoes not just at one time, but you're getting them throughout the season, um, don't go out too early, and like I said, they do not like cold feet, so make sure that their, um, nicely soil temperature is warm. Doesn't so matter about your air temperature, but the soil temperature has to be warm. Uh, by plants that are healthy looking, the taller plant is not always the better plants, okay? So make sure you're choosing something that's dark green. Um, that's really, really important. Um, enrich your soil with compost. You should be doing this in any container, whether it's a big flower pot, a raised bed, or in your garden. Um, support your tomatoes when they're young. Don't wait and be like, oh my gosh. I need to add that tomato cage and it's like four weeks in because guess what? It's so much harder. So put your cages, put your staking in, put your systems in right when you're planting your plants so you can grow together. Okay. Um, mulch, 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 put grass clippings, not anywhere near the base of your plant if they're green. Um, you can use cut up leaves, anything like that. 
pinch of flowers at the very bottom and maybe you can pinch off your first set of flowers because it'll stop the plant from producing fruit and starting to grow your plant larger. So just depending on your mind frame on when you want to start getting more plants. Okay. And then always inspect for diseases. You see yellow brown leaves, chop them off right away. Compost right away. You don't want anything. And then always watch your splashing from the soil and the because that's an also another thing. As far as the, I had one question about because you had mentioned pollinators earlier. So I know that they say don't go clean out your gardens, even whether it's your vegetable or your flower gardens, like too soon. And of course, last Sunday I started to think, to do that. I think wait a minute, stop. Yeah. So like, when is a good time in this area to start cleaning out all your gardens so that you're not disrupting pollinators? When your air temperature is above 50 degrees consistent. Okay. That, that's a good rule of thumb. Okay. Yep, yep, and you're absolutely right. Leave it. It's easier to leave it, and it's better for the environment to leave everything there. Yep. Um, peppers are also a very tropical plant. They like hot heat, so hold off on your peppers. Um, plant all different kinds of peppers. Um, mix compost or organic matter when you're planting them, water immediately. Um, you'll notice that you'll need to water less as they're actively growing because they're actually ready to start setting to go for, for that food and water. Um, but when they're tree transplants, you need to get those established. Um, all different kinds of peppers, grow peppers you've never grown before. Take a risk, it's a lot of fun. Sweet basil is a really great plant. They thrive in heat. Um, basil thrives in heat. So pinch your plants as often as possible, especially if you're trying to get a high yield. Um, if you pinch about the second set down, um, at the node, which is where your like leaves come out of the stem, you're going to pinch it off with a really sharp nail or a really nice pair of little clippers, um, and then it'll produce two terminal shoots. So you'll have extra branches, extra branches, extra branches, and you can produce that all throughout. Yeah, you, you don't agree, want to. Do you agree with a mess of tender? Hmm. I know that's an old one. Yeah, I thought you were going to say plant your basil with your tomatoes, which is I mean, really fun. Yeah, I'm not really sure. normal though. Huh. I wonder if they're competing for something. Well, I, I don't, yeah, no, I haven't heard that. No, I haven't. Yeah. For the basil, it's just you're trying to prevent that little flower bud, right? Yeah, because once it flowers, then the clover cheese. Yeah, it does. Yep, yeah, it does. So you want to just not only prevent it, but you want mm -hmm. to get the most yield out of it. And so pitching will make it push. Is it the same thing with like cilantro? Because I've always had trouble with that. Cilantro is a tough one. Yeah. Um, they're biennial, so they like to fall right away. They like to grow sweet, and, and you know, <laughs> they reseed themselves really well. But um, cilantro can be a little. Yeah. Um, they love heat. Grow them in full sun. Harvest above their leaves for pesto. I use every single one of them and everything. Um, all different kinds of varieties. There's a spicy one, there's a purple one, all different kinds. So it just depends on what you're interested in and how you're going to use it. Um, my mother in law dries hers and uses it in her pasta sauce all year long. I make mine into pesto and it's um, So it just depends on how, how you'd like to, to grow. Um, if you can self seed these right into the garden, you can buy transplants or you can start them early under light. So it just depends on how much time and dedication that you have and how much money you're trying to. So all these methods are just depending on you as a gardener in your own home, in your own setting. So like when they start selling transplants and stuff, you can plant when it's hot. Yes. Leaves, then... Right. So you wait. <laughs> that be patient because if you have lice, that's really great. Um, but if they're already hardy for outside and then you bring them inside and then you bring them outside again, you're gonna stunt their growth as well. Um, it's almost like shocking them. So yeah, it's really hard because really you shouldn't be planting to the end of May unless you're using row covers, right? Um, and that, but everybody wants you to buy them, um, and that's really so it's best to wait. It's just leave them in the store. We just love yeah, them. Yeah, you can use artificial lighting um, if you can protect them outside in like an outdoor greenhouse or uh, create like an outdoor space. Cold frame would work really really well. With some hay barrels, and then maybe just like some old windows on top uh, that will stay a little bit warmer on the inside. You can store things in there. Yep. 
Eggplants is the other tropical that I was warning you all about. There's all different kinds of eggplant. Um, so if you're used to planting one kind, try a new variety. Uh, the white ones are really, really great. It's got, um, I thought, oh yeah, they have like a Japanese and then a uh, Asian variety that sometimes are a little thinner and a little longer. Um, so if you like eggplants, um, they really like to be hot. I would mean, grow them in any less than a five gallon pot per plant if you're going to be growing them in a container. Um, most of your garden should be southern exposure anyway. Um, it doesn't like wet feet, so don't put it next to something that you have to heavily water. Okay, so don't put it with your tomatoes. Tomatoes like a lot of water. Um, trans, you can either transplant, um, but it, you can't really direct feed them because you do not have a long, a long enough growing season. So you definitely need to start with it or feed them with it. Okay, when we talk about seeds, yes, I have a horrible time getting my seeds. Not to germinate, but once they start getting up, they seem to get yeah. Yes. Why? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, there about that. Do you have a light source? No, that's the problem. <laughs> so really, you should. You cannot really do a really great job at starting seeds unless you have a greenhouse or you have an artificial light source. And it doesn't have to be expensive. You can make just a PVC frame. You can use an old shelving unit, bookshelf. Find something creative around your home, and then just get a hood. Um, and then just buy your bulb. It doesn't have to be an expensive thing to do, but you really won't grow great seedlings unless you have light. And you don't need them to germinate your seeds because what are you putting lights on besides soil? The only thing that can photosynthesize is the green, right? The chlorophyll in their leaves. And so you don't need light to germinate, but as soon as they pop off, your light should be no more than two to four inches away from the top of your seed. What kind of light bulbs are they? Yes. Are they anything or no? Are they no, no. Okay, There's so they're special light. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. there's a special ball. That's okay. I just wasn't sure if it was anything. I just hate okay. to say something and not know the exact name. That's of them, okay. But, um, a lot of places use like the halogen bulbs, the sodium bulbs, they're really, really big and expensive. So, like, I think of like a more of like a hydroponic thing. Um, but I think they're full spectrum light. Okay. I'm sure it's easy to find. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but like I said, you can use anything and attach that hood as long as you can move those lights up and down. That's the most important thing because as your plants grow, your light source needs to go a little bit higher. So they sell very expensive kits you can buy, um, or you can just um, use an old, um, is it the fluorescent, the garage bulb? Yeah, plus, and, yeah. Um, and replace the bulbs with a with a light source. Yeah, but they need a lot of light for a long time. They need like 10 to 14 hours of light. And grow them in your darkest room in your house because you don't want them growing towards that light that's coming through that bedroom window. You want them to grow in your darkest house. The darkest spot in your house is with your own light source over them because you only want them to grow towards that light source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> and see, and see, yeah. 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 Yeah, so there's lots of benefits. I can go off on a little tangent if you want, but there's a lot of benefits to seeds. There's a lot of benefits to transplants, and then there's a lot more benefits to direct seeding in your garden. Okay, those are going to be your strongest plants you have, are the ones you can directly seed directly into your garden. Because right from germination, they're growing that back root, they're growing those main stems, right? And so those are your strongest ones. They're exposed to the weather. They're exposed to the to the sun right away. When you grow seedlings inside your baby in them, right? It's got enough artificial light source on them. They're warm. You're feeding them water regularly. And then you have a fan on them to like kind of pretend that they're outside, right? Because you have to have a fan on your seedlings to strengthen the stem. Because where that stem is in the soil, really important that they flex, right? Because that's where your root flare comes from. So it's really, really important that you're mimicking your outdoor. Right, so then you take your beautiful seedlings and then you take them outside for about 20 minutes and then you bring them back in. And then you take them outside and expose them to more sunlight and then more sunlight. It is so much work, but it's sustainable, right? Because you can save your own seeds and yeah, it is a lot of work and it's a lot of time. So that's why most gardeners are hobbyists, right? Um, that's that's where they, they become hobbies and all hobbies are. So what are some just yeah. like that you could direct seed? Big seeds. Think of anything big. Cucumbers, big 
peas, beans, um, anything that's a large seed, any of your melons, water, squash, beets, onions, anything that is kind of a bigger seed, I would say it's definitely seed. Carrots, you direct seed, lettuce, you direct seed, spinach, you direct seed, um, all of those. So really the only things you're really growing inside of those tropical that like top soil. So things that we don't have a long enough growing season to directly seed. Um, we use a, I was just on a Zoom meeting with a, a grower out in uh, Jamaica. They can direct seed because they have the season for it. We do not. Unless you're row covering and you want to be a zone pusher. You know. um, potatoes are really, really great. Uh, growing potatoes is really, really easy. They don't take a ton of time and attention. You just want to make sure that you're hilling them, you're growing them in or in kind of a container, uh, you do not want your potato to ever be exposed to the sun. That's why it's important to continue to hold them. Once the tops, the it's a beautiful plant too. If you've never grown a potato, they're absolutely gorgeous. They're beautiful flowers. And then once they start dying, and the potato bugs show up. <laughs> yeah, that's and, true. And, that's and, true. and they turn a little ugly. They do, yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's certain things that you can do to hopefully avoid. Um, all of that, so sunny location, make sure you have really well drained soil. Um, they are recommending that you use a certified organic seed. I guess that depends on your, you know, of what you would like. Um, yeah, potato, the potato beetle is a, is a problem. Um, <laughs> Our plants that we get don't look like those. They look like a, a ladybug only without the spots. Oh, They're yeah. Brown, you know what I'm yeah. Yeah. But man, it's like, yes. it, and it, it happens like overnight. I mean, one one time I was growing my plants was just beautiful, and my dad took a curse on me. I guess he walked out and asked, he goes, "I'm surprised you don't have any bugs." And, oh. and honestly, God, it's here like the next day. <laughs> the next day, I walked out there. And I started, I seen one like on the leaf, so I started turning the chair off and off. Oh, and yeah. Underneath, underneath, yeah. You know, it was like, oh, um, within like a week, I had like, like, oh, like, I had all these, you know, her grandmother, oh, put a you know, dryer sheet bed on there and get rid of them. all these, nah, I don't know, I've never been able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah, especially that happened to me when I had a, a, a crop of like, um, your grasses, so your collards and your greens, and I had the bug underneath, and I didn't even see it the same color. And I'm like, oh my gosh. There's certain birds that eat them a lot, I guess. Well, you know, so I was hoping to frame the these <laughs> <big> flies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. But it actually does yeah, it works. It's short. You go really on the yeah. Well, and, and you will lose a few, I'm sure. But uh, pitchfork, and you just loosen the soil, and then just pull gently on the plant, and your potato can come right out. Yeah, or turn your soil over. But start on the outside and work your way in, and just like slowly lift that loose soil because they're they're going to be in a you know in the next mound, right? Um, so, or you can grow them in a burlap sack, you know, and then just tuck the sack at the end and then put it in your garden. Um, cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, all vertical trellising uh, vegetables. So use your space wisely and grow them vertically. If you do not want to put a trellis in, grow them against your chain link fence if you have a chain link fence. Um, grow them up your gutters if you, ha if you have the ability to do that. Um, well, they're not going to be too heavy, but um, but definitely utilize your garden space by trellising these trees. Only to provide a little bit of support as they get bigger because they're going to be heavy. Um, but try and use your vertical space as much as possible. They're all great for direct seeding. They're really big seeds. Some plants don't like to be transplanted, and sometimes transplanting them, purchasing them, and buying them can inhibit their growth because it's going to take that much longer for them to get comfortable. The final things that they need. Okay, so you can always, um, and there's so many different varieties. There's varieties that are disease resistant. That's really important. 
Um, especially if you know that you already have issues with powdery mildew, you can buy them that are powdery mildew resistant. Um, where do you get those that are like, how do you, I don't, I've never seen that. I mean, I yeah. can go to a local garden first. Where can you find the one? Yeah. Um, so some, and here's the other thing about seeds. You should buy your seeds locally. Local growers that grow in our kind of environment. If you're buying seeds from Missouri or you're buying seeds from a seed company that's out west, they have a way different growing condition than we do. And they're growing these seeds and then harvesting them and then selling them to other climates. And so uh, you should buy local. Um, I know fruition seeds is local. They grow right in our environment. Um, I know that Harris seed has some farms that grow outside, but they really try to get um, seeds that will grow really well in our environment. So those are two that I would. Fruition and Harris. Yeah, they're, 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 they're local. So. In, in Berkeley, not that yeah. I know. Those are really two big seeds. Yeah, and so even if they're like local to our area, sometimes they have farms in other areas that grow them, that they can grow you know, a larger crop over a period. So it's just really important to make sure that you're buying seeds that you know are going to grow in Look at that watermelon there. Mm. And I planted watermelon. They didn't. I, I thought they were right. <laughs> they got big. Yeah. I cut into them and they were this yucky pink color. Oh, and they really? <laughs> and what did I do wrong? Uh, well, that's a really great question. Maybe they weren't quite ripe yet on the following. I mean, I'm sure there's like tips and tricks on like how to know when they're ready to hoe grow. Um, most of the time, it's when the tendrils nearest to it are dead. Um, those like you know, the tendrils, the, the spinny part, it's like actually a leaf, it's modified leaf, the tendrils are. And so, usually, when the tendrils near that fruit are dying, that's like the big indicator that that fruit is a little bit weird. Late. I don't know to be sure they've done on it, but they, they take a long time um, to produce a problem. Yeah, yeah. Now, if they were done, they yeah. have to keep the good size and they weren't done on the finger. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I'll kill it. I'm sure. Yeah, just wait a little longer. Yep. Can um, you do the same thing with the uh, summer squash? What? Wait, the tendril? The charlotte you know what you're talking about there from vertical yeah vertical. vertical uh you can but they don't chug as much so um they get really bushy and you're talking about green bean and stuff yeah yeah i have seen where you can like put them up in a tomato cage you keep them off the ground and use like your your need for powder your um resistance for powdery mildew and stuff and you cut the leaves but really the biggest problem with green bean are the squash borers like once they get in and the time starts dying it's really slow um, but really, squash just grows more in the bush than it does uh, in the vine. Oh. Yeah. And don't overplant. <laughs> so, holy cow, once they hit, it's like, once, it, once it's time for them to start producing, they produce a lot. Chalicine on a wire mesh. I used a lot of trellising for the um, handicap accessible gardening that I used to do. We had a lot of people that, that needed to sit while they were gardening. Trellising is really great because your fruit just kind of dangles down and then you can use just your girl's upper body to be able to pick up the produce and stuff like that. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Um, so trellising your cucumbers is really great. Just make sure you're planting a cucumber that you know you're going to need. So if you're growing a pickling cucumber, make sure you're pickling it. Um, so just know the kind of variety that you're growing and what you're planting. So, yeah. yeah. I have a great experience with them in my great bed. Those dry out. With my leaves dry out. Oh, oh. Yeah, well, especially in a raised bed because you have to water so much more frequently. Um, because they hang yeah, but raised beds are like growing in a container. And so one inch a week, I would say, would be really great for an ingrown garden, but you should probably water even more frequently. 
Um, and it's mostly because of the surface area around your garden, and then it's windy, right? And so I don't know what kind of a variety of a container garden you have, but I would assume a wood one. And then there's cracks, and so the wind is just drying out. Well, we, we could have some kind of moved the things in the house. Oh, oh, you have a liner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, well, they still dry out. Um, ground gardens in the ground have like this is the water table, whereas something above the ground doesn't have the like, water table. So it's gonna dry out a lot quicker. So uh, anything in a raised bed you're gonna use the water more frequently than the ground. Spinach is really great. You can grow spinach in the you can grow spinach in the winter. Um, just depending on how much dedication you're interested in putting into your garden. Some people claim that winter growing vegetables are better than the harvest that you get in the heat of the summer. Um, so I went to a Penn State conference and um, they had a whole guy on how to grow a garden uh, in the winter, how to grow your all your vegetables in the winter. And they said that carrots and spinach are so tasty in the middle of the winter. Get a four season CSA in Pennsylvania. I was shocked. I was like, wow. no way. And he said they, they taste better growing. In. And uh, sometimes you can have less insect damage, not always, um, but sometimes your pests and your diseases or life cycles are not going or during that time frame. So sometimes you can have even less pests and insect damage um, and diseases because it's too cold for some of those to actually survive. Oh gosh, I'm really late. I'm sorry. I need one of those ribbons. Is that talking about banners? Um, radishes. Um, I don't love radishes, and I would if you don't like radishes, still plant radishes, and I'm going to tell you why. They are such a good cover crop because if you have really clay soil, those roots grow down so deep that they're actually providing water, access for water. So even if you don't like radishes, I would plant these bedtime radishes, the really long ones, um, especially as your cover crop, and especially if you have really bad poor draining soil, because they are breaking up that clay soil. Um, we are now recommending no-till gardening practices. If you need to till, they're saying the brood fork, which does anybody know what a brood fork is? A brood fork? Yeah. Uh -huh. Have you heard of it? Anybody? It's like a... Uh, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain here. It's like got two poles and then a, a crossbar, and then it has these like fingers, I guess is that's what you say. And then you stick it in the ground, you stand on it, and then you pull it back, and it's just to loosen the soil. Um, because what's happening is you're breaking down all of that network every time you till. Not only are you bringing weed seeds up to the surface and you're bringing weeds in the garden, um, but you're breaking up that network of mycorrhizae and all of the things that your plants really need. You're breaking up all of those structures. Um, so they say that you should, you know, compost your garden every year, loosen your soil, but don't double dig and don't grow the till um, because you're breaking What's soil structure. A brood? Yeah, B R O O D brood fork. They're kind of expensive. Buy one, share with your neighborhood. <laughs> Mm, me too. So that was my biggest question I was thinking. I garden. I don't do the weight of Georgia Tech. 100 by 100 feet. Wow. Piece of land that I plant. I try to plant every year. Yeah. Well, it's only me that takes care of it. Yeah. It kind of gets out of hand. Last year, I didn't do anything with the back of it. It was a mystery full of weeds. Not for that. I go over that with something like the cream right now, the cream for the vegetables. Oh, the so that the weeds oh. don't germ. You would be better off smothering it. Uh, with cardboard, black plastic, landscaping fabric, something like that, then you would be to um, put synthetic fertilizer or a synthetic oh, uh, fertilizer. They didn't know whether yeah. the vegetables take that off. I mean, you, mm, you not the vegetables wouldn't be the issue, but um, it's not always effective, and you're still probably going to have to pair with another cleaner method anyway, which isn't what hand food to do with the water. But if you get if you cut them down to ground level and then you smother them, you're going to be way better off. 
Um, just even putting in a cardboard and set the cardboard down, and then everything underneath will die. As long as you're giving, you're cutting off their life source, they cannot germinate. Plants will not survive without sun. That is why you need a full sun garden um, for vegetables and stuff. So once you cut off that light source, they can't grow any longer. So if I hear you saying all the weeds taken care of, yeah. What's my best? Do you want to go buy flat plastic and put it in the wooden walk? Just in the past, you're saying? Yes. You can. You can. Or you can just use cardboard and mulch. You need free mulch from your local municipality. Uh, and that would do just as much, if not better. Yeah. So the reason why black plastics and mulch and uh, weed barriers are not put in the garden is because it doesn't allow any of that organic matter to filtrate down into the soil. So really what you're doing is you're just putting a layer on top and everything under it is just compacting. Um, which is actually the opposite of what you're doing, which is increase that organic matter and, and, and revitalize those nutrients year after year. Yeah. So if I go to jail, I should just basically go to jail to uh, soil. If, if you need to rub it till. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, it doesn't go down very far. I'm just saying how far do you go down in order to not pull up, pull up the weed seed? Yeah, there's not a good answer for that. <laughs> They're everywhere. Both. And so once you bring them up to the light, that's when they all germinate. So really you're better off making sure that your planting plan is like really good. Uh, once you have your garden designed, you won't need to be doing all of that weeds and watering and, and all of that stuff. As long as your planting plan is like self-sufficient, then that's the best thing for you. So making sure that you're, you know, covering those that sort of so even if you're not going to plant that area in your garden, put something in there as like a bed. Put just radish bed in there for now, um, just to kind of help, um, you know, utilize that soil space. And even if you're not going to plant it, plant your cover. Even if you're not going to utilize it this year for vegetables, but you want to use that space in the future, just plant something like a cover crop or some like an annual bed or something like that. Cover crop is something that you would use to put nutrients back into your soil. Like what are they? Uh, rye, radishes, um, clover. Yep. So you never want bare soil. Like you, you always want your soil covered. Um, bare soil is is just uh, is an unhealthy practice. So you always want your soil covered. Yep. So. And then cover the bejeebies out of there as well. So and your leaves and stuff like that. You never want sun exposure right onto your soil surface. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. I have an elevated bed. And I put in the radish in one half, and I put carrots in the other half. Mm -hmm. And I had a hundred percent no shrub. Whoa. <laughs> this was an erased bed to By the yeah, elevated. Okay. By seed, received, like, did you had just purchased them yes. or had you had them for a long time? No, no, I just purchased them. And you had zero germination? Zero. Oh, wow. Wow. So many wow. Five years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> huh? It sounds like something like they eat seed. Yeah. I wonder, did you have, did you notice any seed, the uh, birds and stuff trying to steal all your seeds or anything? Well, it's an elevated garden, and we had just set it up this year, that last year, and we had gotten the raised bed soils put in it. Yeah. And it's actually in a place that's fenced off. Wow. Hmm. So you do start them too early? Do you think it would have been about early? Memorial Day? Could you have, okay, then that wouldn't be it. Could you have buried them too deeply? Every single one, maybe. I mean, if you're making a trench, you know, it would be kind of similar. They could have been too deep where they wouldn't have actually reached the soil surface by the time that probably didn't like, you know, the first leaves came out. Okay. Um, that could have been an issue. Um, did they get enough water? Your seeds need a lot of water when they first germinate because the water is penetrating through that hard seed field. So seeds are like lunch boxes, really. So, I actually have a timer. Got all the hoses. But were the hoses close enough to that seed in particular? 
because once those soaker, if you have soaker hoses or something, uh, they're very particular about where that water actually goes. That's why I was saying earlier, you really got to be careful about where you're putting those hoses because they won't always reach the plant. Because okay. um, I noticed when the timer went off, it, the, the water was running from the bottom of the oh. <laughs> elevated. Oh, well, maybe they had too much water in the side because it was rotting. Could they have been too wet? Even though it comes through the bottom, considered to. Okay, yeah. maybe that's what it's Yeah, no, well, they could have been too wet. Um, onions, if anybody grows a lot of onions, you can grow onions by seed. You should have already planted them weeks ago if you were going to grow onions by seed. Um, they're one of the seeds, or excuse me, onions and leeks are the earliest seeds that you want to start growing. Um, so if your seed's starting, you're probably starting about now-ish with your seeds. Onions should have been any weeks ago, okay? So onions and leeks, if you're growing by seed. A lot of people grow by these little starts here, where they actually buy bulbs and grow. Um, so, um, let's see, they take up little space, um, the low competitive power growers and rows. So, same thing with most of your plants, you want to, or you do a lot of organic matter. Um, they take a really long time to germinate, by right? seed. They're very patient with those. Um, or you can direct seed them, uh, harvest them. When you pull them out of the ground, you need to give them a dry before you utilize them, um, and then don't store them next to your apples and your tomatoes in your pot for the winter. Do you, how, how, how deep do you bury the little onions? This part here? Yeah, that top part. Yeah, so, so bury all the way under the ground? Uh, they say to, to seed them about four inches depth. So, do they have a bit of depth? Yeah. Yeah. Um, beets. Um, really great about beets is they're a dual plant, right? You can eat the top and the bottom. Um, so that's really, really great. Any root crop is really, really great for your garden, um, especially with your soil structure and what they do for the garden. Um, just don't leave them in too long because then they become bitter and woody. Um, you can grow beets by direct seeding them right into the garden. I have only one spot beet like has like a transplant um, just because that was the first time I've seen them, so I had to buy them. Um, but I was all the way on Saratoga. I've never seen them locally. I'm not sure if any local farmers actually seed their beets, um, but they're really great in the garden. Um, and then just make sure that if you are doing beets and you overseed, um, that you're actually using thinning out practices, which is you're going in, you're looking for the strongest one, and then you're using little scissors and you're cutting right at the soil surface to kind of cut off those beets for thinning. Um, make sure that your soil is loose and draining if possible. Um, that way that root crop can grow pretty well down there. Um, and what's really great about them is that um, you can interplant them. You can plant them with other vegetables. You can plant them in the base of other vegetables and stuff like that because they don't need a lot of top growth. They just need the, the ground, right? They need the root space, not the root space. And most Leaf and bloom don't need full sun. They can tolerate still good shade by taller plants. So, um, and then also they're fast. Uh, from from planting to harvesting, you can take them out and replant new ones, or you can plant a different crop in that area that is more of a cold season crop, right? That can go farther in the fall. Collard greens you can harvest all the way until it frosts. Um, same with any kind of grass that grows. The cold season vegetable. Very good for your plants. Oh, it's a great for blood pressure. We have seen not so they don't I know what we say about blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, they have a short term. I wish I had a fan. Five weeks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. They say that use a seaweed fertilizer after sowing. They like cool conditions. Uh, companion plants um, because they can tolerate some of that shade. Okay. Garlic, you should uh, put in every year in the fall. And then when it comes out in July, you can plant something else, like lettuce or peas or beets or radishes, because um, they're all fast growing and you can plant them, you know, multiple times a year. Um, so always plant garlic if you can, especially in the fall, anytime before the, the ground is. Do you 
need to cover it with anything or you can just no you it. don't need to but it's it's always best to not leave bare soil so if you can put some like straw down or something on top of the leaves leaves okay. would be really good yep, anything like that don't um just try and keep your critters out of it um so always add organic matter before you plant by weeks so that it has time to incorporate a supplement of soil um, whenever you're adding organic matter, it, if it's raw organic matter, you don't ever want to put it too close to the base of the plant um, because you don't want it to burn. So incorporating it around the plants will still give it just as much um, like uh, health and nutrients than it is if you're putting it directly on the plant. Okay. Um, so if you put it in beforehand, you prep your bed, then you plant. Um, it'll definitely give it some time to actually like integrate into the soil. Rhubarb is a perennial vegetable fruit, maybe. Um, if you really enjoy rhubarb, this is a really great plant. They get really big and they're really hard to remove. They mature shradish. So once you put it in your planting plan, make sure that you're planning for it to stay there for a really long time. Um, same with asparagus. They stay for a very long time. Uh, every plant has a life cycle, right? So even if you have beautiful plants, whether they're vegetables, a perennial vegetable or a perennial ornamental, they have a life cycle. They do have an end date. Um, so don't think that just because it's perennial, it's going to come back and come back and come back and come back. Because there is times where your plants will die for no reason, just that they're like, um, asparagus, 15 years. Wow. And those roots are big. So make sure that whenever you're planting them, uh, you have a big, good surface of straw because you need to have them covered. And that they're there for a very long time um, because they grow horizontal, they grow like dominantly through the ground. And so um best to contain them. You already fed all that until you can. Um my grandfather has a wonderful, wonderful patch of asparagus. I've never had such fun. Plus any <laughs> I like to grow way too many things to like right. me and my state is dedicated to one thing. So um yeah, so you just literally cut it off with a knife, and it's amazing how beautiful fresh asparagus can be. Um, lettuce, so many different kinds of lettuce. Um, the only really important thing about lettuce is you want to plant in succession, so every two weeks, plant some new crops of it, uh, plant different varieties of it. Um, and then once it's full, you got to pull it because then it just becomes really uh, bitter. bitter. Yeah. yeah, so once you see that flower soon coming, get rid of it. Make your, you know, look at your garden, get it all fluffy, beautiful again, and plant some new stuff. Um, because, and they can tolerate shade. So if you're trellising cucumbers, you're trellising um, watermelon and cantaloupe, use the back side of it because they can tolerate that shade, okay? So utilize the space at the bottom of your trellising for short vegetables such as your beets and your lettuces and your spinaches because they don't like to be sitting out in that direct heat. So if you have a part of your garden that gets shade quicker, that's where you're going to put your shade tolerant vegetables, um, shade tolerant. Um, so any of your greens, okay? Um, so all different kinds of lettuce, they all grow different sizes. Iceberg, I've never grown iceberg lettuce, but 12 inches apart, um, whereas leaf lettuce can grow eight inches apart. Um, they all have different growth. I mean, you all know that romaine grows in an upright where this bird is a low growing head. Um, so every kind of green grows a little bit differently. So just make sure when you're using your planting plan, you know how much space you get for each variety. Um, put your tall stuff in the back, um, put your shorter stuff in the front. Um, square foot gardening is a really great way if you need to like, figure out where you're going to put everything. You guys can just use a grid in your garden. Um, but you want to make sure that you're not putting your um, vegetables that are going to shade out other plants on the southern side. So all your tall stuff should be on the northern side of your garden. That way it's not providing too much shade to any other parts of your garden. So, and then know your families and then know your creepers. If you're going to do a vegetable garden, know that you should probably put some limits on your mint and your lemon balm and uh, I hear time. I've never had a problem with my time too much. But um, strawberries, anything that's growing um, that produces runners, what we call runners, um, make sure that you know that going into it because there's ways that you can combat that by planting them in a pot and then moving the pot in your garden. They'll help try and keep their roots, you know, limited um, or know a place that you can divide and give them away frequently. But um, 
don't plant a really beautiful garden and then not know that you're going to have like invasive plants. Um, and then make sure you're really choosing your varieties um, that you really want to do if you want to grow fruit trees. Make sure you're trying more versions of them because they can get really tall. I'm sure apple trees can get you know over 20 feet tall if you're not buying the right variety. So um, make sure that you um, you know what variety you're planting and if they need a, a second right? If they need another pollinator of the same genus and species, which is really important. Um, and then make sure you know how much work is into fruit trees. Spraying, they, have, they need a lot of work. Uh, fruit trees need a lot of work. So um, just be really cognizant of what you're buying. And I, we have a team called the Fruit and Vegetable Team that works with Corner Cooperative Extension. They're a really wonderful resource. Um, and we did a big presentation with them. And her biggest recommendation was do not buy your fruit trees at Home Depot. <laughs> okay. yeah. Make sure you know where their your trees are coming from, where they're grown from the root stock on. Um, it's really, really important that you're spending a lot of money that you're going to get something that's going to produce what you really are expecting it to produce, the varieties you're expecting it to produce. Um, okay. Anybody have any other random questions? Um, we need to look at my little love notes here and make sure I. I got everything on there. Oh, you know what they call radishes when you're planting them, not for food, but for like other purposes, like a, like a cover crop or something? They call them bio drills. I thought that was a really an interesting thing. Um, so if you are growing um, to help with like soil compaction and uh, another reason why you're planting is the cover crop, I thought that was really important. Um, and you can plant them in the um, late fall, three to 10 weeks before the last frost. So even if you think your garden is done, you can plant a, plant some radishes to help. So I know I went really over. I can't believe I did that. I thought I was going to go short. I thought it was going to be 45 minutes. So thank you for staying. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for all of your questions. And really good luck with your garden this year. One more you question about composting. Um, you said it could be just like a pile on the ground. Okay. Yep, that's all mine is, is a pile on the ground because I had to make it easy, otherwise I wasn't going to do it. Right. And so I just put up a border if you wanted of something around yeah, it. And then I use these log sticks that I can't like cut off and put somewhere or okay. burn. I just put them around. Um, the woman, we have a composting room here in the county, and uh, she uses like Nevada, so it was more visually appealing because okay. she lives in the neighborhood. I don't care what my neighbors think so much because they're fine with something. Pile and right. you want to make sure that it's not under a tree. You want to make sure that it has it can get water from the rain. Okay. You want to make sure it's not too far away because you want to use it. Um, and they say that three by three is your best. Three by three. Sorry, you have to rotate it, like isn't it? Sort of. So that I think that's kind of a myth that they need to rotate your pile. Okay. You don't really need to rotate it if you're actively adding food scraps to it on a regular basis. So because when you're taking if you're digging in and you're putting the food scraps and then you're burying it, that's as much aeration as it is. Yep, yep. Another method is stick some sticks in it in all different directions. Yeah, right. And then you pull out the stick so that the air can get in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you really just want to make sure that the air's in there. And you always want to make sure that you have three times brown as you do green. So you need leaves and wood chips and sticks and all those kind of things. Raw egg shells. Raw egg shells, I would rinse. Rinse. Because you do not want to put any meat or dairy no, in your garden. Dairy, yeah. So yeah. you want to rinse your eggshells right. and then crush them with your hands before you stick them in the meat. Or put them in a the blender if you don't want to crush them with your hands. <laughs> or, you know, bash them up a little because they do take a little bit longer to decompose. But they're they really are great source of calcium. Right. So there's yeah. a lot of this information on the website. Yes. Yeah. So much information on our website. It's Cornell Extension. Yep. CCE e. Monroe. Okay. Okay. Method over extension sites aren't great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Especially composting. Um, if for manure, if we have old piles of manure, yes. is the fall the only time to do it? You can't do it. Oh, no, 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 no. As long as you have aged manure, as long as it's not fresh, very aged. You can add it to your compost bin, it's a really great activator. Uh, really thins the you know little microorganisms that yeah. have love it. So yeah. it makes them work harder because they really like it. But so so you can mix it right into your garden. Yeah. The only thing is, is that would do it like a week or two before. before. Okay. Yeah, okay. so you really want to kind of just settle in there. Yeah. 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 Ye
Ooh, I think that's the same. I, 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 I don't know if there's a big difference. You just want to make sure that whatever animal you're getting it from and don't get vegetarian. Yeah, whatever they eat. Exactly. And the other big thing is, is if you're going to like a local farm to get it, make sure that you're asking if they have treated their animals. Because that's Know your source. That's the best thing you can do is know your source. Um, anyone at the extension that would be helpful with uh, black knot and like maybe in choke care that mm -hmm. I'm be What do you need to know? Like you already have it identified. So yeah. how do you train it? Is there any way to feed it? Yeah. Um, uh, do you have a pen? Uh, let me give you my email address. I will put you up with um, our diagnostician. Okay. She might have some resources for you um, that would be um, helpful to maybe mitigate some of the damage. Um, my email address is A is in Ashley, T is in Peter, 824 at cornell.edu. Okay. Thank you for that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm really sorry about that. You know, it's you know, such a beautiful tree, and I need to lose it. No, the, everybody else's is looking terrible, and I'm waiting for them to cut theirs down, and we've been working on it. Yeah. But so we we're been, moving, we're moving it. it out of there. We have to do it like now because it's going to get warm and start to be, you know, whatever it is, the spores. And then we should spray it. And then I've been using the stuff that you put in the trunk. And mine mm -hmm. is definitely looking way better than anybody exactly. else's. Oh, good. That's but good. it's just if there's anything else I can try, I would love to save it because it's just so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. The awesome. choke cherry in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is. Oh. I put some blue in my hair. Oh my God. Yeah, the black hand just just yes. brown. Yeah. Hey, I know a master gardener who has a tree that is still surviving 14 years later. Yeah, really? 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 Because it was meaningful to her and she had to a lot of time and attention to making sure that she injected it. Yeah. She's yeah. been injecting it for 14 years. So, oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, but her, you know, her daughter gave it to her when she was young and she planted it right next to her house and the husband, you know, lost all the other ones, but this, you know, so. Yeah. Really so well, well, I wish you all the moon and luck with your vegetable garden this year. I hope that you know, I answered everybody's questions.